and Baptist Schubner about scattering theory for Lindblad operators. So there will be no semi-classical analysis, but there will be non self adjoint operators. Um, here is the outline of my talk. So first I will try to motivate the study by recalling some notions and some definitions about Lindblad operators and quantum dynamical semigroups. Then I will state our main results, and finally I will try to give you the main ideas of the proofs. So let me start with uh, what is a Lindblad operator and what is a quantum dynamical semigroup. So let me begin with the uh, physical context that we want to study. So typically we are considering one quantum particle that interacts with a quantum system which is supposed to be localized. So I will call the, this localized system a target. And both the particle and the target interact with the rest of the universe, which I call the, the environment. So typically, you can think of the quantum particle as being an electron with spin. And the target then may be a magnet. Or another situation could be that the quantum particle is a neutron, and then the target is um, a nucleus. So here's what we want to, to study, the, the, the situation we want to study. I have a localized quantum system, the target, and then we send a particle to the target. We look at the dynamics of the particle and we want to look at what happens. So typically, there are two situations that may occur. The first one is that the particle is going to interact with the target, and then it will be scattered of the target. And another possibility that may occur, for instance, if the particle is a neutron and the target is nucleus, is that the target may capture the particle. Okay. So the aim of this study is to try to understand this physical situation by looking at sh scattering theory for suitable operators. So now let me go to mathematics. The total Hilbert space of our system is given as a tensor product of three components, HP, which is the Hilbert space for the particle, HT, the Hilbert space for the target, and HE, the Hilbert space for the environment. So the total Hilbert space is written here. It's just the tensor product of the three Hilbert spaces. The total Hamiltonian, in a very general form, is given as the sum of these four terms. So the first one, this is just the free energy of the particle, HP, that acts in its Hilbert space. The second one is the free energy of the target, HT. The third one is the free energy of the environment. And of course, we had an interaction Hamiltonian, HI, that represents the interaction between the three components of our system. Then we want to study the dynamics of this system. So of course, H total generates a unitary dynamics. So I will work in the usual Schrodinger picture. The states of the whole system are represented by density matrices, meaning trace class operators. So this notation J1 stands for the trace class operators on the total Hilbert space H total. And states, of course, are positive and of trace 1. Then the full evolution in the Schrodinger picture is given as usual by this expression. If the initially the full system is in the state rho, then after times t, the state in the, is in this state. 
So you just conjugate rho with the unitary evolution, e to the minus i t h total on the left, and e to the plus i t h total on the right. Now the problem is that in concrete situation, of course, the degrees of freedom associated to the target and the environment may be very complicated, so that it is hopeless to understand the full dynamics of the system. So if you are only interested in the dynamics of the particle, one way is to define an effective dynamics or reduced dynamics for the particle, which is defined as follows. So suppose that um, there is some fixed reference state for the target and the environment, which I write here, so it's rho t for target, e for environment, and r is for the reference state. So you can think typically as this state as being the projection onto the ground state of the system composed of the target and the environment, assuming it exists. Then the radius dynamics for the particle is given by this expression. So if rho p is the initial state of the particle, so trace class operator on the Hilbert space for the particle, then rho p of t is given by the partial trace over the degrees of freedom of the target and the environment. And then you look at the full evolution with initial state given by rho p times the fixed reference state. So of course, the effective dynamics depends on this choice of reference state. You look at the full evolution, and then you take the partial trace. So this defined uh, dynamics, an effective dynamics for the particle, or reduced dynamics. And okay, let's call it a dynamical map, an effective dynamics for the particle, which has the following properties. So of course, what I wrote here, rho p of t, this expression does not define a semigroup, right? Because you take the partial trace over t and e. But uh, using some approximation, for instance, a weak coupling limit in some cases, it's possible to, uh, to obtain from this expression using an approximation a map, a dyna dynamical map, lambda t, such that for any t, lambda t is a bounded map on the space of states for the particle. And lambda t is a strongly continuous one parameter semigroup, which is trace preserving. So the, the trace of lambda t rho is equal to the trace of rho for any rho. And it's also positive for any rho. If rho is positive, lambda t rho is still positive. So if you want to understand the dynamics of uh, the particle, a natural question, of course, is to try to write down the generator of this dynamical map. We know that it exists, right, because you have a strongly continuous one-parameter semigroup on this binary space. So uh, Kosakowski and Ingard and Kosakowski obtained um, necessary and sufficient condition for an operator L to be the generator of such a dynamical map. So consider a complex separable Hilbert space H. Then an operator L on this space. So this is the space of trace class operators that are supposed in addition to be self-adjoint. So this is a, a real Banach space, but OK, that not, does not change much, much the problem. So an operator L is the generator of a strongly continuous trace preserving and positive one parameter semigroup on this space if and only if its domain is dense, identity minus L is surjective, L is dissipative, dissipative meaning this inequality. So here the sign of rho is defined thanks to functional calculus because rho is self adjoint, so it's well defined and the trace of L rho is equal to zero. So this theorem uh, gives necessary and sufficient condition for an operator L to be the generator of a dynamical map in the sense before, but its form, of course, is not explicit. Now, Lindblad, in a, in a very famous paper in 76, uh, uh, 
had the following idea to replace the assumption that the dynamical map is positive by a stronger assumption that it is completely positive. So following Lindblad, I will call a quantum dynamical semi group a map lambda t, such that for any t in zero infinity, so lambda t is a bounded map on the space of trace class operators, such that it is a strongly continuous one parameter semi group, it is trace preserving, so it's the same, but now we assume that it is completely positive which means that uh, for any n, lambda t times the identity on the space of trace class operator on h times cn is positive. So it is a stronger assumption, but uh, you can use some physical argument to say that it is a natural physical assumption. And with this assumption, Lindblad proved, uh, derived the general form of a Lindblad operator so here is the theorem, so H is still a complex and separable Hilbert space. Then the generator of a norm continuous quantum dynamical semigroup. So of course this is a strong assumption here. You assume that it is not only strongly continuous, it is norm continuous. Then we know that the generator has to be bounded. But with this assumption, then you can prove, or Lindblad proved, that the generator is of the following form. So maybe I should write it on the blackboard because I will use this expression several times. So L of rho for any trace class operator is given by the commutator H0 rho minus rho H0. And then you have minus I divided by two the sum over j of c star j c j rho plus rho c star j c j and then plus i the sum over j of c j rho c star j. So since L is, since the, yes? I mean, it's, it's a composition, right? You, you have a map on the space of trace class operators. Everything is a composition here, yes. Okay. So since we have considered a norm continuous dynamical semigroup, the generator is bounded. So H0 is itself a joint and bounded, and all the CJs are bounded. In fact, in addition, the sum over J of C star J C J defines a bounded operator. So this expression makes sense. So you see that to uh, define the generator, I use the minus I here, so that formally I can write lambda T as E to the minus I T L. This is just a convention to have e to the minus ITL, which uh, is close to the usual e to the minus ITH, which is a unitary dynamics. But this is just a convention. So this theorem is not known in general if you only assume that you have a strongly continuous quantum dynamical semigroup. But still, we will define a Lindblad operator as being an operator of this form <coughs> but with H0 and CJ, the operator that may be unbounded. So if you do that, uh, Davis uh, has proven that it is well defined in some dense sense, and it indeed generates uh, a quantum dynamical semigroup. So more precisely, I take H0 to be a self-adjoint operator, no, unbounded. CJ, to simplify, I assume that they are bounded and that there are only a finite number of such operators. Then the operator L with this form, um, it's an unbounded operator, but you can define it on this domain, which is the, the natural domain on which you can define it. I mean, rho should preserve the domain of H0 
and the commutator between H0 and rho should extend to uh, an element, a trace class operator. Then you can prove that this generates a quantum dynamical semigroup, meaning a strongly continuous one parameter semigroup, which is trace preserving and completely positive. Now, the main assumption of uh, our study, now I'm going back to the physical situation we want to consider, is that the reduced dynamics of the particle, which interacts with the target and the environment, is given by such a Lindblad operator. So, more precisely, it's given by a quantum dynamical semigroup, which is associated with such a Lindblad operator. Uh, okay, and another simplification, I assume that there is only one CJ, no? So L is the commutator between H0 and rho, L of rho, minus this expression. So it means that if the particle is initially in a state rho, a trace class operator which is positive and not trace one, then after times t, the particle will be in the state rho of t equal e to the minus i t l rho. In other words, it solves this equation which is sometimes called the quantum master equation or you can also find it under the name quantum mechanical Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, so this will be the starting point of our study, and now we want to um, study scattering theory for such operators. So th there are not much works in the uh, mathematics literature about this subject. At the beginning of the 80s, Davis, then Aliki and Aliki and Frigger will did some work about this subject. So basically, what do you want to prove? We assume that the free dynamics is generated by this part, H0 rho minus rho H0. So this generates a group, which is an isometry on the, on the, on the space of trace, trace class operator. So typically, we would like to prove something, some statement like that. Suppose that the interaction between the particle and the rest of the universe is not too strong. Then we'd like to prove that for any initial state rho, which is not a bound state, so you have to first understand what is a bound state in this setting, which is not obvious. Then there exists a scattering state rho plus, such that the full dynamics applied to rho as time t goes to infinity is close to a free dynamics applied to, to this scattering state. And this equality should also for the norm of trace class operators. Okay, so uh, let me emphasize that uh, this is not a group, it's only a semi-group, and it's not even an isometry. Uh, okay, but this, this uh, statement is sometimes called weak asymptotic completeness. And it is, in fact, equivalent to proving the existence of a wave operator. So more generally, we'd like to study the following two waves operator. So the first one is the usual outgoing wave operator defined by this expression. So t must go to plus infinity here. For t going to minus, infini minus infinity, it may be not well defined, of course, because e to the minus itl then is not a contraction semigroup, and omega minus is this operator. So since e to the minus i t l zero, the free dynamics is isometric, proving the existence of this omega minus is equivalent to proving this weak asymptotic completeness, as usual. And then in this context, assuming that everything is well defined, the scattering operator is given by the composition of omega minus and omega plus. Okay. So let me now state our main reasons. So I just recalled here what uh, we are studying. So L of rho, this is the same expression as in the blackboard, but with only one of the operators, CJ, which is supposed to be bounded, and H0 is self-adjoint. 
Uh, okay, so you can rewrite this, the expression of L of rho if you want by this h rho minus rho h star plus this term with h given by h zero minus i divided by two c star c. So in particular, h is a dissipative operator acting on the Hilbert space, and one of the main ingredients for studying. Uh, scattering theory for Lindblad operator is to study scattering theory for dissipative operators in Hilbert space. You will see why in, in a moment. So the first theorem concerns the existence of omega plus of L L0, which is given by this strong limit. So in, in general, it's more easy to prove existence of this operator than the other one, right? Because you have the free dynamics on the right, so you start by applying the free dynamics, which may be explicit in examples. I will give you examples in a moment. So this existence is more easy. Okay, so the first result, which uh, was proven by Davis in 80 in a slightly different context, but it's not very difficult. Um, I mean, you suppose that there exists a dense subspace, subset D in the Hilbert space, such that for any U in this dense subset, you have this assumption, the integral converges. So this is the usual assumption that you do when you want to apply Cook's method to study the uh, scattering theory for H0 on H. Okay, if you do this assumption, then it's two lines to prove that the wave operator associated with H0 on H exists. The statement of this theorem is that with this assumption, you can also prove that the uh, scattering operator associated with L and L0 exists. So it's not completely trivial, but still it's not very difficult. Basically, you have to apply Cook's method and use, at some points, the cyclicity of the trace. Okay, now let me go to... Uh, the more difficult point proving weak asymptotic completeness, or if you prefer the existence of this operator omega minus of L zero L, which is by definition equal to this strong limit. So one point of our uh, work was to um, recognize that a very convenient assumption in this setting to study scattering theory is to consider Cato smoothness estimates as assumptions, which are well known in uh, concrete examples of to derive such assumptions. So suppose that there exists a positive constant C0, which is less than two, so the interaction should not be too strong in this sense, such that we have these estimates. So it means that C is relatively smooth with respect to H0, in the sense of Cato, with a constant less than two. So L0 is the, the free dynamics, uh, as before. Then with only this assumption, you can prove that the two waves operator exists on, on the space of trace class operator, on the whole space J1 of H. Um, Okay, so here again, we only lead, need an assumption at the Hilbert space level. Okay, this is an assumption that concerns only C and H0. And with this assumption, you can prove this statement. And if you strengthen a little bit the constraint of the, on the constant C0, so if you assume that it is less than 2 minus square root of 2, the statement is, becomes more precise now. The two waves operator are invertible as maps, as bounded maps on the space of trace class operators, and the two operators L and L0 are similar. So let me make a few comments about this assumption in red. So as, as I mentioned before, uh, assuming that there exists a positive constant such that this holds, uh, following the well-known paper by Cato, 
uh, it corresponds to saying that, that C is H0 smooth. And it is well known that it is equivalent to assuming that the imaginary part of the free resolvent H0 is uniformly bounded for Z in C, for Z outside the real axis, if you put the weight C on C star on the left and on the right. Now, one very useful observation in, uh, in the context of dissipative operators is that C is always relatively smooth with respect to H. So in, in this respect, um, it, is more, it is easier than scattering theory for self-adjoint operators. I mean, in, in several uh, examples, you have to work in order to prove such an estimate if H, for instance, is H0 plus V, where V is a perturbation of H0. It's not obvious, and you have to, to prove some resolvent estimates, for instance. In the context of dissipative operators, this is obvious. I mean, you just have to differentiate something. It's one line to prove that this, this holds. So this assumption, this, this, con this, this property is very convenient. But you see that here we have a constant 1 in front of norm u square. And in fact, we can state the same theorem as before, but with a, a slightly different condition. Um, OK, so I suppose that still C is relatively smooth with respect to H0, but not with a small constant, with any constant. So if there is a positive constant that I called C tilde 0, strictly less than 1, such that this estimate holds, so C is relatively smooth with respect to H. So maybe I should have written what H is. Let me write it here. So H, this is the dissipative operator in the Hilbert space, H0 minus I divided by 2 C star C. Okay. So we know that the estimate is always true with C tilde 0 equal to 1. But if we assume that it is true with C tilde 0 strictly less than 1, then we have the same results, the two wave operators exist on the whole space J1 of H. And if in addition, we assume that C tilde 0 is less, strictly less than one half, then the two wave operators are invertible and the operators L and L0 are similar. No, I did not change the sign. This means the inverse semigroup. Yes, OK. It's possible to define this yes, it is possible to define the inverse semigroups, but they are not contraction semigroups, of course. Of course. <laughs> but it is possible to define, yes, it's possible to define e to the minus itl with t negative. OK? Generally, generally no, generally, it's not possible, but here I have, um, I mean, l is l0, which is a group plus a bounded operator. So of course you can define, yes. Yes, and in fact, th this is the, the remark here. Assuming that this holds, this estimate holds with C tilde zero strictly less than one, it is in fact equivalent to assuming that E to the ith, so here I change the sign, E to the ith is not a contraction semigroup. A priori, it could blow, it could blow up on some initial state. But uh, if I assume that C tilde zero is strictly less than one, it's equivalent to assuming that it cannot blow up. It is a uniformly bounded semigroup in L of h. OK. OK, now let me go to some examples. So I assume that the uh, particle that I am considering is a non-relativistic particle with Hilbert space L2 of R3 times H, where H is the Hilbert space for the internal degrees of freedom. So uh, to simplify, let me suppose that it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. 
and the effective dynamics of the particle is supposed to be generated by such an expression. So the interaction is the same as before, and L0, the free dynamics, is supposed to be generated by minus Laplacian plus a matrix which corresponds to the internal degrees of freedom. So for instance, if you have an electron with spin, you should think of this operator, uh, I mean, this Hilbert space H is just one, two degrees of freedom for the spin of the electron. No, uh, a problem in this uh, framework is that the explicit form of the effective dynamics, so the explicit form of the Lindblad operator, may be very complicated in general if you have a complicated target and uh, also you have to deal with the degrees of freedom of the environment. So the rigorous derivation of the effective dynamics is in general an open problem, but um, in some cases, you can um, define it using a weak coupling limit, and this is also a famous paper by Davis, uh, where he, he obtained the form of the Lindblad operator for a finite dimensional system coupled to a free heat bath. But okay, in general, it's, it's an open problem, but using some heuristic argument from physics, for instance, if you assume that um, the interaction of the particle with the environment induces the coherence in position space, then it seems reasonable to assume that the interaction C is of this form, G of X times uh, an operator on the finite dimensional Hilbert space. So you can think of S if you want as being the spin operator if you have an electron, or it can be the identity. It doesn't matter, but G should be a, a function with sufficiently fast decay, which is related to the assumption that the target is localized in space. So with this form of C, it's easy to uh, obtain uh, corollaries of our theorem for this example. Um, so here's the corollary. If you assume that the composition of C with uh, multiplication by the norm of x is less than 2 pi minus 1 half, then the two wave operators exist on uh, the full space of trace class operators. And if it is less than 2 minus square root of 2 p to the minus 1 half, then in addition they are invertible and the two operators L and L0 are similar. So this is an obvious consequence of our theorem together with this uh, Cato smoothness estimates, which has been proven by Cato and, uh, and Cato Yajima. But I mentioned Simon here because he showed that the optimal constant for this estimate is equal to pi. So if I use this uh, together with our theorem, I get this corollary. And you can do the same thing if you want by using other Cato estimates, for instance, you can use uh, this well-known uh, Cato smoothing, I mean the Schrodinger smoothing effect, which has been uh, again proven by different authors, uh, by uh, Constantin and so on, uh, Benardzi and Kleinerman, and again uh, Simon has proven that the optimal constant is equal to p divided by 2, or another example is to use, uh, to make the assumption that you have a Rolnik potential for C, meaning that this norm is bounded, and then it's easy to prove such an estimate. So the point here is that you can get explicit condition in examples with our CRM, which are uh, possibly easy to verify in a concrete setting. Okay, okay no, um, for the moment what I described do not allow for uh, understanding the, the, the phenomenon of capture. I mentioned at the beginning that it may be possible that the, the particle is sent to the target and then the target captures the particle. So if you want to understand it, you have to do something different and to define in particular a modified wave operator. So how do we do that? No, I uh, uh, assume that uh, the interaction between the particle and the rest of the universe do not only produce 
this operator CJ in the effective dynamics, it's, it's also uh, have the consequence of adding a self-adjoint part to the free dynamics given by this operator V here. So for, to simplify, I assume that V is relatively compact with respect to H0. Um, then now my Lindblad operator is the same as before, but I have replaced H0 by H0 plus V. It is still a well-defined closed operator on the space of trace class operators. So you can write the same expression as before, but no H is not only H0 minus uh, something which is as a, a, a positive or negative imaginary part, you also have this perturbation V. So I will write HV for the operator H0 plus V. Now I have to make some assumptions on V. Uh, so here are the assumptions. So again, in a concrete setting, it's known how to verify such an assumption. So you should still think of H0 as being minus Laplacian and V as being a potential, if you want. Then I assume that the spectrum of H0 is purely absolutely continuous. The singular continuous spectrum of H0 plus V is empty, and HV is supposed to have at most finitely many eigenvalues with finite multiplicities. Then the two waves operator, the well-known operators, W plus or minus associated to HV and H0 and H0 and HV. So of course here you have to project onto the absolutely continuous part of HV. They are supposed to exist and to be assumed totally complete in the sense that the range of the incoming and outgoing wave operators is equal to the absolutely continuous spectral subspace of HV, which coincides with the orthogonal complement of the pure point spectral subspace of HV. And the two other wave operators have a range equal to H. Okay, so this is an assumption that uh, we know how to verify it. In concrete example, I will give you uh, conditions in the case of Schrödinger operators. Okay, no, uh, before defining the modified wave operator following Davis, I have to introduce a few uh, subspaces associated to H and H star, the dissipative operator H and H star. So I call H B of H the closure of the vector space generated by the set of eigenvectors with real eigenvalues of H. So in fact, we know that if u is an eigenvector of h associated with a real eigenvalue, it will also be an eigenvector of h0 plus v. Right? It's, uh, uh, I mean, it has to be in the kernel of c. And I also define hd of h and hg of h star as the set of vectors in the Hilbert space such that the norm of e to the minus i t h u goes to zero. And the same for h star, but then you have to change the sign of time. Then the modified wave operator considered by Davis is the following. I let p be the orthogonal projection with kernel h b of h plus h d of h. So we should think in this context as HB of H plus HD of H as the set of bounded states. Okay? So the projection projects outside the set of bounded sets. Okay. Now the modified operator is given by this expression, so it's the same as before, but you project on the left and on the right with this projection, this orthogonal projection on the orthogonal complement of the set of bound states. Okay. Now here is the theorem that we proved. Now I assume that uh, now C is uh, relatively smooth with respect to HV. So HV it's H0 plus V. Okay, it's a self-adjoint operator but with the perturbation V. 
we assume that we have such an estimate, so of course here we have to project on the absolutely continuous spectral sub subspace if you have a bound state for HV, then this cannot hold uh, unless uh, the eigenstate is in the kernel of C, but in general you have to project onto the absolutely continuous uh, part, and we assume that we have such an estimate with CV less than 2. So again, we know how to verify such an assumption in the case of Schrödinger operators, for instance. No, L0 is the, the free dynamic, so it's still the same, associated with H0. Then the modified wave operator um, defined in the previous slides exists on the wall space. And if you take an initial state rho, so a trace class operator, which is positive and of trace 1, then you have that this quantity, the trace of omega tilde minus applied to rho, is between 0 and 1. And the interpretation is that this number gives the probability that the particle initially in the state rho eventually escapes from the target. So 1 minus this quantity gives the probability that the particle will be captured by the target. Okay, so how about example? So I, I, um, I consider again a non-relativistic particle as an example, so the same as before, but now I have minus Laplacian plus the internal Hamiltonian plus a perturbation given by V of X. So L0 is uh, the free dynamics associated with minus Laplacian plus the internal Hamiltonian, and I have this uh, perturbation it means conjugator with v of, v of x plus these operators. So v is supposed to be real valued, of course. So what about the conditions on v that we can uh, make? Well, for instance, you can suppose that v of x decays like uh, minus 2 minus epsilon for some positive epsilon, and you add the assumption that 0 is neither an eigenvalue nor a resonance of HV. Then using uh, results that have been proven by Benarzi and Kleinerman, I mean, with this assumption, but before by uh, Roche or uh, Jensen and Cato, we know that there exists a positive constant C1, which depends on V, of course, such that you have such a Cato smoothness estimate with weight equal to 1 divided by x to the power 1 plus epsilon. So this holds for any u in L2. Then again, I can uh, apply these estimates and use our abstract theorem to deduce that under the previous conditions on v, and if you assume that c is sufficiently localized, meaning that c composed with x times plus 1 plus epsilon is bounded with uh, uh, a norm less than 2 C1 minus 1, where C1 is the, the constant in the previous uh, Cato smoothness estimates. Then we can deduce that the modified wave operator omega tilde minus exists on the whole uh, space of trace class operator. Okay, now let me uh, finish the talk with uh, giving you some ideas, the main ideas of the proofs. Okay, so this was the first result using this, uh, this Cook assumption to apply Cook's method. So I already mentioned it. I, uh, I just recalled here the form of the Lindblad operator that we are considering. Then if we make this assumption, we can prove that this operator exists on J1 of H. So the idea of the proof follows a paper by Davies. You apply Cook's method, and then you use cyclicity of the trace. So let me go to the more difficult part, where you want to prove the existence of omega minus of L0 and L. So you start by applying the full dynamics, and of course it's more complicated. Uh, so we say that with this assumption, the wave operator exists. So here is the idea of the proof. Let me uh, define LH of rho 
as being equal to h rho minus rho h star, where uh, remember that h is h zero minus this imaginary uh, term. Then we decompose. We want to prove that this quantity has, exists as a strong limit on the wall space of trace class operator. So we decompose this term by adding e to the minus ITLH, this operator, and then, of course, we have the difference. So let's first consider the first term. So it's given by this expression, but you can rewrite that as a composition in this way, right? And then, if we know something about the scattering theory for dissipative operator, meaning if we know that this term strongly converge on the Hilbert space level, then we can deduce that this will go to omega minus rho omega minus star, where omega minus is the wave operator associated with h0 and h. So assuming we can prove it exists, but with this assumption, in fact, we can prove that it indeed exists because, uh, and here, in fact, I do not need the assumption that C0 is less than 2. For any positive C0, it, it would still be true because we have this Cato smoothness estimate and we know that C is always relatively smooth with respect to H. Okay, this was the uh, estimate that I uh, showed you before. So we know, in fact, that omega, that W, sorry, W minus exists on H. So this is fine. No, the more difficult part is to prove the existence of this term as a strong limit. So what can you do here? Well, you can write the difference of the two dynamics as an integral. So you will get this integral from 0 to t. So there's something uh, maybe a little bit complicated, but you can see that you have e to the i t minus l t minus s l0, e to the minus i, t minus s l h. So it's the same as before. So uh, formally, if I let t go to infinity, then I will get the integral from 0 to infinity, and I will have this term, omega minus c, and etc., omega minus star. So all the problem, I mean, formally, it's, it's easy. But the whole problem is to just justify this limit using some version of the uh, dominated convergence theorem. And in order to justify this limit, you have to study uh, scattering theory for dissipative operators in Hilbert space. Okay? So you have, in particular, to understand this operator W minus that appears. But also, it's very useful to understand um, uh, the usual outgoing wave operator W+. Plus. So scattering theory for dissipative operators has been studied by many authors in, in many contexts. But in these abstract settings, uh, let me mention these papers by uh, Martin, Moshizuki, Davis, Simon, and uh, more recently, Kadovaki. OK, so I will come back. Yes, I will come back in, uh, in two minutes about this, this part, which is really the key, the key point of our proof. So I, let me just, uh, before, uh, mention this result. Remember, if I assume that in this estimate the constant is strictly less than 2 minus square root of 2, then the result is more precise in the sense that the two wave operators are invertible and the two operators L and L0 are similar. So how do you prove that when you can again introduce this auxiliary dynamics? And then uh, the point is to estimate the Dyson series that you can, um, you can obtain from expanding using Duhamel's formula and iterating. And then you can estimate the Dyson series with this assumption. So to conclude, let me give a few words about uh, scattering theory for dissipative operators in Hilbert space in this abstract setting. Uh, OK, so the, the first result, which I mean is not very difficult, but um, we, have, we had to prove this because we didn't find it in the literature under this assumption. So assume here that C is relatively smooth with respect to H0 but with any constant C0. Then with H 
given by this expression, you can prove that the two wave operators exist, and moreover, that uh, W plus of H H0 is injective, and W minus has a dense range. Of course, the problem here is uh, that uh, the two waves operators are not isometric, right? Because uh, e to the minus i t h is a semigroup of contraction, so uh, it's not an isometry. And it could happen that the range of w plus is not closed. And in fact, this is the main problem that we have to uh, deal with. We had to find conditions such that the range of this operator is closed, which may not be true in general. Uh, okay, but then it's fine if C0 is less than 2, then the two wave operators are bijective. And in fact, the, the, this last statement, bijectivity, in the case where uh, the constant C0 is less than, than 2, is the result which is close to uh, what Cato did in, uh, in 66. In, in fact, in a more general context, but in our setting, uh, it's, it's easier, and uh, also, well, this is a small point, but we do not need the assumption that uh, the resolvent is uniformly bounded. Okay, you, you remember this assumption is equivalent to saying that the imaginary part of the resolvent H0 minus Z is uniformly bounded. And uh, in uh, his paper, Cato used in addition the assumption that the whole resolvent is uniformly bounded. In fact, you do not need that. You can do a proof uh, completely time-dependent. You do not need to use the stationary arguments here. OK, so the last uh, result is the following. So this is for the case of capture, where I added this part V to H0. And then I had this assumption, this Cato smoothness inequality uh, for, uh, of C with respect to HV, but if I project on the absolutely continuous part, then we can prove that this operator is injective, and in this case, its range is indeed closed, because we can prove uh, that it is equal to the orthogonal complement of HB of H plus HD of H star. So HB of H, it was the, um, the space of eigenvectors associated with real eigenvalues, and HD of H star is the, the state such that E to the I T H star U goes to zero. So if you take the orthogonal complement, you get the range of W plus. So in particular, of course, it, it's closed. So let me remark that in the case of dissipative Schrodinger operators with small imaginary part, there is a, a recent result by Wang and Zhu where uh, they use some uh, global limiting absorption principle with some weights on the left and on the right. Uh, one point here is that we do not need uh, such a global limiting absorption principle. I mean, uh, because, uh, again, because of this uh, fact that C is always relatively smooth with respect to H. And also, Okay, no, he, of course, one of the main uh, improvements of such a result would be to relax the assumption that you have uh, a constant with, which is not too large. It may be possible to do that in some concrete examples by remarking that you have, in fact, this equality. The range of W plus is also the set of U such that the inverse semigroup stays uniformly bounded. So the point would be to prove that this is closed. And uh, there is a paper by Goldberg where, where he considers Schrodinger operators with complex potential, but under some implicit uh, condition that uh, the operator does not have real resonance on the real axis and also other condition. But in this case, still, this is indeed uh, verified. So uh, it could be possible to prove such a thing without a smallness condition. OK, well, uh, I thank you for your attention. You. So, questions? Francis?
Please. In your equation with a local perturbation, you can think of using some uh, propagation estimate in order to get some integrability in time for large time. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, yes. It is possible actually to write a, a, tra uh, a density matrix version of propagation estimates mm -hmm. and. Uh, have you thought about this? Or? No, no, but yes, I mean, this, this is certainly what uh, we plan to do for fut future work. If you want to go beyond such a result, you have to do some concrete analysis and you have to fix some uh, concrete model that you want to study, for instance, based on Schrodinger operator. But uh, no, for the moment, this was really a, an abstract setting because um, yeah, I mean, it could, could be very complicated. You, you could do some uh, abstract setting if you have some yes. uh, conjugate operator, for yes. which you have uh, some posita uh, positive commutator uh, locally in energy, th it's possible to... Yeah, yeah, it may be possible. And we could also use some version of Moore theory yeah, for yeah, dissipative okay. operator as uh, Julien, uh, Julien Roy did or uh, Golenia and Boussaid. There are some version that, uh, yeah. that we could use. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. This is uh, something we would like to, to try to do at least. Another question? Oh, Vesla, Vesla, attend. Vesla, So it's clear that comparing the two epiperitis, the most difficult is the omega minus. Yes. This omega minus that yes. you use the, the condition. Yes. But usually, for dissipative operator, when proving this one, one impose some kind of rigid theorem for the dissipative uh, semigroup. Yes. No, you, you impose some condition about the group uh, exponent minus i t is zero. Yes. So if you try to, to prove this one, because so you start by another hypothesis, of course, this is not so easy, but usually this could be obtained having some assumption that uh, implies that you have Raja theorem. The Raja theorem is just the same, so that yes. you change H0 yes. by H and yes. C by some other things. Yeah, yeah. This is my, my question. <laughs> I have another one, but it's all So out. what is the question if I... If I the question is if you could prove the existence of omega minus, yes. without passing by this argument, with yes. given constant yes. C0, yes. Z1, by yes. an argument which impose some condition about the integral where it's involved with the that's the yes. semi group uh, mm -hmm. the Raja theorem. No, that's, that's possible. That's, uh, that I don't know. We didn't try it. That's possible that it works, yes. But uh, I don't know. We, I, I would have to look at it precisely. Another question? Comments? Nothing? Thank you again. Okay. <laughs>